Hello and welcome to series four of the Public Interest Technology PIP Colloquium. We are delighted to be hosting this series and have an engaging program lined up. My name is Roba Abbas and I am a Senior Lecturer in the School of Business at the University of Wollongong, Australia and the Socio-Technical Systems Technical Committee's Chair at the IEEE. I'm joined today by my co-host, Professor Katina Michael, who is the Director of the Society Policy Engineering Collective in the School for the Future of Innovation in Society at Arizona State University, and is also the Editor-in-Chief of the IEEE Transactions on Technology and Society. Katina and I would like to acknowledge the events team at the College of Global Futures at ASU for their support of this series. Before we introduce our distinguished speaker for this session, I would like to take a moment to reflect on our colloquium to date. We journeyed from series one, which focused on values, responsible innovation, and COVID specific technological responses, to series two, which centered on storytelling, imagination, and participatory design methodologies, and onto series three, which emphasized the global perspective with respect to the social, the regulatory, and the ethical considerations relevant to the design, development, and delivery of technology in the public interest. In this series, we illuminate a path toward transdisciplinarity, hosting international speakers who will share with us their perspectives on topics such as experts and expertise, innovation ecosystems, multi-stakeholder approaches, and the opportunities and challenges relating to addressing complex societal challenges. In this session, we'll be hosting Professor Ilias Karianis to deliver a second presentation from it, following on from his initial talk in this series, which was titled Democracy, Environment and Technology, Interactions, Interdependencies and Implications for Theory, Policy, Practice and Politics, which was a rich and nuanced presentation that required a follow up. During this session and for our live attendees, our order of, it, of events is as follows. We'll first be hearing from Professor Karianis, after which, in time permitting, we'll be engaging in reflections and questions as well as a discourse before our closing remarks. So please feel free to use the chat function during the presentation and during this session to reflect, to share your questions, or to indicate that you wish to speak post-presentation. We are delighted to welcome and introduce Professor Karianis, our speaker for today. Dr. Ilias Karianis is a full professor of science, technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship as well as the co-founder and co-director of the Global and Entrepreneurial Finance Research Institute and director of the European Union Research Center at the School of Business at George Washington University in Washington, DC. Dr. Karianis' teaching and research activities focus on strategic government, university, industry R&D partnerships, technology road mapping, technology transfer and commercialization, as well as international science and technology policy, technological entrepreneurship, and regional economic development. Today, we are fortunate to have Professor Karianis back to deliver a second talk titled Digital Transformation, Industry and Society 5.0, Pit Challenges and Opportunities. Welcome Professor Ilias Karianis to the Public Interest Technology Colloquium. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, so much, Roba, and all. Thank you for your presence and time. Let me uh, share a screen. Um, <clears throat> Um, as I said earlier, I hope to have an interactive uh, discourse today rather than just a more of a lecture slides driven uh, commentary. Um, this is, let me uh, see, enlarge this, Let's see if we can, we can see my slides. Okay, uh, one second, please. All right, so. Uh, the theme remains democracy, environment, and technologies, and what it means, the interactions, and what it means for theory, policy, practice, and politics, okay? And what I would like to um, uh, go to, I will skip through slides with your uh, indulgence. Um, the points uh, that I wanted to revisit and refer to to begin with is, first of all, the what, um, going from digital to analog, not just digitalization or analog to digital, but from digital to analog transformation as needed and appropriate, seeking a balance between the techno and human centric. And as I explained, this is about nuancing, allowing for nuances and uh, limiting or controlling the, the filtering out of the nuances that effectively the digitalization, the conversion of the analog into the digital is. Um, and so 
have a balance between techno and human centric uh, design theories and then policies, practices and politics. An example would be uh, the digital currency uh, adoption. There has been a broad adoption, almost complete uh, tr uh, transformation or, or transition to uh, digital money in some countries, uh, for instance, in uh, Scandinavia, that has excluded uh, older people. So from a uh, public private uh, view perspective, this is not something to be uh, taken lightly or ignored. Uh, then of course we have issues that have to do with uh, sustainability uh, green uh, technologies and uh, whether and how we can have uh, some kind of uh, uh, discussion as to what technologies are truly green and what are uh, really uh, not so much uh, a big question for instance is uh, nuclear fusion which is an open question very challenging currently because of course nuclear powered generation of energy has been uh, a rather uh, unfortunate and unsuccessful to some extent and therefore given the the pitfalls no pun intended here uh viewed from a pit uh public interest technology perspective um the question is is technology really developing? Uh, how has it developed and changed over time, uh, locking our thinking into a certain mindset that may really look back and reflect only past experience, while that should not be ignored uh, in any case, uh, is also wrong. And this is really at the heart of managing risks. Um, we need a more perhaps intelligent, uh, more adaptive, more perhaps even technology enabled, uh, public interest technology and, and AI for that matter, enabled uh, approach um, to, to check, uh, assess, evaluate, and then monitor options like a nuclear fusion, given what has been happening, for instance, in Europe and the pressure to uh, effectively decouple from a major source of uh, natural gas uh, and and, and uh, go back to using coal or traditional even nuclear power generation. Fusion may be a best way forward that needs to be further explored, understood, and assessed. We have some work on that. Um, the industry 5.0 and society 5.0 concepts I presented last time, I will refer to uh, again, hopefully will be part of our discussion. Uh, this is the context, the framework within which many of the things I mentioned can fit in. Um, they effectively emphasize balance, whether it is uh, the industry or the society perspective, a balance between human-centric and technocentric um, configurations and solutions. The helices or helical architectures, we'll get to that in a moment, the how or unified, emerging unified theory of helical architectures um, is really trying to establish and understand how can we best design and uh, maintain, um, implement and maintain um, ecosystems. Uh, we're operating on the assumption and basis that uh, we have a systems approach that are interlinked components and that is in fact, in my mind, at least, a big part of what public interest technologies are about. We do not operate or think in terms of isolated islands. Uh, we should be uh, thinking and operating um, uh, on the basis of at least archipelago or, uh, or, or connected nodes. And that means effectively a network and a system of systems in that, in that, ma in that matter. Uh, and that also, should imply that we are, uh, we, we, we should be thinking about ways and means that knowledge can best be generated, shared, absorbed, and used. This is where the helical architectures uh, enter, in particular uh, involving uh, key stakeholders. Uh, they do not necessarily represent people, but they represent institutions uh, as well as the environment. 
I'm talking about the quadruple and the quintuple innovation helix, the stakeholders there being government, university, industry, civil society, and the environment. And of course, they are five dimensions or, or intertwined, five strands or threads intertwined in a helical manner because the interfaces, uh, the knowledge interfaces for that matter are, are, are optimized, the design and um, their, uh, their presence, the location is optimized. If we have helical architectures, that's just simply learning from and emulating nature. And the question is how can we uh, keep improving on that? How can we ensure that there is uh, as intelligent and uh, sustainable and effective and efficient a conversation and collaboration across different sectors to make uh, as fast and best progress as possible to get best in breed solutions regarding, for instance, uh, environment remediation. Just today, something that we knew or we should have known, but it was again mentioned uh, as part of the UN uh, meetings and the, you know, the World Bank and IMF meetings, in the last 50 years, 70, 70% of natural life has disappeared. So that is a big issue uh, and, and a major wake up call. Um, great barrier reefs in Australia are one case in point, uh, but there's many other uh, issues with bees uh, disappearing and effectively the soil itself becoming uh, a, a scarce resource, and not only in terms of quantity, but in terms of quality. The, 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 the soil uh, degradation uh, means that we may simply need to both try to reverse that and then also then have may have to figure out other ways to produce food. Um, so I mean, these are appear to uh, mundane perhaps issues, but they are very real and clear and present threats. So the point is how can we uh, establish ways to get beyond uh, uh, partisan lock-in um, uh, have a process as has been established decades ago in political science of mutual partisan adjustment, uh, effectively towards some consensus and convergence. Um, the benefit of the doubt used to be uh, uh, taken for granted in most developed democracies. Now, populism and all the other challenges that I have referred to um, have made this, uh, turn this on its head. And this is a big part of the challenge here and should be part of the consideration for designing public interest technology solutions. Uh, we've moved from the benefit of the doubt to the um, handicap of the doubt. In other words, people are mistrustful, cynical, and open to uh, populist influences. And that that is a big problem. We have uh, then uh, the, uh, you know, the implications, and I mentioned already the environmental degradation threats and the, 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 the planet planetary warming is just one part of this. Um, developed democracies and the environment. I, I have labeled them uh, endangered species uh, about two years ago in an interview. This has been true for quite some time, but it is something we need to really recognize to begin uh, a, a transformation of our, of our mindsets and behaviors and engage, uh, even though we may not consider ourselves as, as sort of uh, militant advocates belonging to some kind of organization, we're all stakeholders on this planet and we should figure out ways to engage and both demand and then facilitate the development of solutions rather than just uh, allowing problems to emerge and mature and fester. So we should be more, and we should try to become more part of the problem, uh, part of the solution, excuse me, and not the problem. If we stay inactive or passive, we'll inevitably and increasingly become part of the problem. Okay, so um, these are things that I have shared already. Um, are there any comments or questions at this point? And then I will discuss and come to a closure on my part, the, uh, uh, points from the New Earth Initiative and in brief mentioned the two use cases that I, I touched on before. Any questions at this point? If not, 
we can hold on and hopefully have more dialogue later on. Let me proceed uh, if that's the case then the New Earth Initiative, um, I posted this on the webpage of one of my, my Journal of the Knowledge Economy some time ago. Uh, again, this is a call to become more proactive in trying to reduce the Earth temperature, not just try to mitigate the increased rate of it, uh, which is, of course, a welcome first step if achieved. In my mind, becoming and being more uh, aggressive and more proactive may be uh, a necessary. Um, I'm not sure if it will be sufficient, but certainly it's a necessary step forward. Um, so the idea is to think of policies, practices, and then shape our politics to establish creative partnerships, public, private, people, planet partnerships, as I call them, to. Uh, envision, first of all, and then enact uh, prototype solutions. Uh, that may involve geoengineering, ge geoengineering uh, approaches, um, every technological intervention, every uh, human uh, uh, act of this type has a Faustian aspect to it. Always there is downside risks as well as upside potential. Uh, but if, as I said before, we're at a point that we can't afford to just stay passive. So carbon capture technologies, as well as other types of intervention that simply uh, establish ways to uh, reduce uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, not just reduce the uh, rate of release of, of such gases into the atmosphere, I think is necessary. Uh, step at this point. Um, geopolitics uh, will inevitably remain uh, sort of an elephant in the room. Uh, the different adversaries uh, should figure out a way, being on the same planet, to uh, engage constructively, and that may well be a way, superarching goals and initiatives and, and, and uh, uh, collaborations uh may well be a way to develop uh, more constructive relations uh, among adversaries of uh, traditional form so i'm referring to the different global initiatives whether us driven china driven or otherwise uh promoted and um, promote propose uh, and identify the need and opportunity to establish some ways to collaborate um, that's not naive thinking, that is, I believe, more realistic thinking. And so um, th then uh, the use cases uh, regarding the New Earth Initiative, uh, for instance, is, uh, is are examples that rely on technology. Uh, uh, certainly in the end, these technologies, whether publicly or privately, or in a form of public-private partnership developed, are public interest technologies, um, cost-benefit analysis uh, in terms of determining whether and how it's best to move forward with given uh, alternative sources of energy generation, for instance, um, that would look at uh, the as-is and also the as-should-be and could be, and then uh, use different new methodologies. AI, uh, among other things, enabled uh, regarding metrics, measurement, meaning monitoring and management uh, approaches. So how you, you don't just find one stop shop solution that is simply the way forward, but actually realize, accept, and act on the basis that you have to be continually, incrementally uh, uh, adaptive and improving hopefully. Uh, then adopting and leveraging uh, knowledge, innovation, entrepreneurship uh, ecosystems. Uh, these are effectively uh, modalities. Uh, they certainly build on the helices that we mentioned before. Uh, in essence, looking for ways and catalyzing, triggering, catalyzing, and accelerating growth that is smart, sustainable, and inclusive, looking for ways that 
that uh, whether it is universities or other sources of knowledge and innovation are enabled and incentivized to uh, maximize the value added and do so for both private gain, but also public good. Uh, so that, that's an important part of our capacity to, to transform our, uh, our world and our circumstances. Um, then uh, in connection with that and in support of uh, both points A and B is point C, which is reinventing in a way a public policy as it relates to both fiscal, in fact, and monetary. And, and this is something that is slowly emerging. Nowadays, we see the need for that, actually, given the significant uh, variability and uh, uh, the implications of both the actual changes, whether it is in prices, inflation, interest rates, but also expectations, which is the big factor and the big uh, source of concern for policymakers, both fiscal and monetary. Uh, so the idea and the question is here, could we, instead of saying we set interest rates at this rate and we'll consider this again in a month or whenever, and of course, managing, setting and managing expectations properly here is the essence of uh, uh, central bankers and, and, and other such policymakers. However, could it be possible to figure a way to have this on a much more dynamic basis that in itself would be self-corrective and self-organizing? That in itself could, uh, in essence, filter out and, 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 and push out, push away speculation. So then, um, as I mentioned, geoengineering technologies, uh, carbon capture technologies among them uh, on, a, on a global scale, an initiative to really develop renewable energy uh, sources and technologies beyond what we have and get the big countries and everybody else, in fact, to collaborate. This could be a major United Nations initiative. It's pretty ironic if you can consider that the United Nations was formed during, in fact, the Second World War as, as an effort by President Roosevelt and others, the allies at the time, to develop a framework for global collaboration and understanding to avoid future conflicts and wars. Um, I think there is a real need for uh, identifying and launching global initiatives in a way that actually will both capture the imagination of the individuals, the citizens, and also provide uh, opportunity for benefit, credit, and therefore political uh, survivability and sustainability to the leaders to incentivize them to engage. So this could be one area. And then, of course, uh, the European Union in that sense uh, in fact, would actually be uh, sort of, if if not the honest broker, a sort of a, a intermediary, having more soft power than other uh, power, acting and connecting uh, the other major uh, powers and adversaries uh, to bring together, bring them together to the table and and identify initiatives to be framed and launched. Uh, leadership is needed there. Uh, I hope that will emerge. And then finally, um, I mentioned these modalities, crowdsourcing, crowdstorming, crowd uh, uh, funding, um, which can well empower the individual to both have a say and then have a role, including in an investor sense, into these initiatives. Um, of course, again, transparency is critical to be maintained and assured. Um, I was very saddened to uh, learn yesterday uh, through a, a BBC uh, uh, exploratory uh, uh, investigative uh, journalism piece, how the, the Chinese uh, platform TikTok actually has been uh, exploiting the suffering of refugees in Syria 
to seek funding from people all over the world, crowdfunding, uh, and, and then keep 70, 70% 70 of the monies with a local facilitator taking another 10% with less than 20% left for the actual people the money was meant to go to. Um, so this is, um, well, <laughs> this is uh, be beneath, be beyond tolerance and beneath contempt, as I would call it. And this is something that needs to be avoided at all costs. It doesn't mean that the technologies are inappropriate the way we're using them is. And so this, in a nutshell, is the set of uh, challenges and opportunities I'd like to revisit brief comment on the in innovators. Let me go further now to the uh, use cases and conclude. Um, and uh, I know I ended up taking a little bit longer, but that was to be expected, I'm sure. So uh, first of all, uh, this. This is how we design effective and efficient. This is very important, of course. Waste uh, needs to be minimized, if not abolished. Um, waste not just of resources but perhaps even more importantly of opportunities and this is where the efficacious effective and efficient use of knowledge and the opportunities to both generate and then integrate and synthesize knowledge to produce uh, higher order benefits and effects uh, starting with learning is critical and this is what these concepts are built around uh, first of all the the word scarce uh, strategic knowledge, arbitrage, and serendipity is about exactly the two phenomena of knowledge, serendipity, and knowledge arbitrage that we have identified as key drivers and determinants of the level of effective efficiency, efficacy of an ecosystem uh, where knowledge is generated, shared, absorbed, and used. Uh, and innovation entrepreneurship ecosystem is exactly such a case in point, whether it is the uh, Silicon Valley or the Boston area in the US, well known, to mature such cases. But there are many parts around the world where a lot of public monies and public interest technologies are being uh, used uh, and invested to help create, engender such environments, such ecosystems. In most cases, there is failure. And the reason for that, in my mind, in our opinion, and per our research, is that there is, uh, you know, there's a gap, there's a deficit in maturity in the ecosystem. The, the level of efficacy is, is too low. And what happens then, uh, there is speculation. Uh, private investors are happy to uh, effectively take a very small amount of risk, uh, le relying and leveraging primarily on public funds. And um, entrepreneurs, uh, in essence, eschew or avoid shun such cases unless they feel they have grown mature enough to be promising enough. So there is a threshold and there's a critical mass uh, challenge of maturity that is a proxy for efficacy. Okay, and so this is what we're referring to, and we've researched, we've modeled, we've used intelligent agents, to simulate an operation in an ecosystem. We've compared, in fact, and we have identified cultural factors and differences, and Saxenian and others have referred to these things over the years uh, between different locations geographically, people, culture, and technology. These are the circles shown in this, uh, you know, multi-level uh, and as we say here, multi-layered, multilateral, multi-nodal construct. Uh, these are basically uh, this is a representation of of of, a, of an ecosystem that could uh, be understood or perceived at the micro, meso, and macro levels, and then also in each level we have bundles, combinations of people, culture, technology. They could be a company or teams or you know, entire sectors or industries. The point being is that, and this is what I'm referring to, each of these small circles are effectively a, a combination of these other circles which represent people, culture, and technology um, uh, components. And it's a bundle in itself. Now, these have to be brought together in a way that is not just uh, relying and building on on resources, but also uh, as perhaps more importantly, on a culture of trust, 
and respect and understanding, sharing openly and proactively and sharing in a way that maximizes the likelihood for discovering serendipitously knowledge that is critical for you haven't uh, come across yet. You're not even looking for it, but your stakeholders, your fellow stakeholders in the ecosystem actually alert you to it. And then also having the the capacity wherewithal experience and uh, perhaps uh, even AI uh, supported uh, um, uh, perception to understand how best to use it. I'm talking about lateral use applications, for instance, and this is the knowledge arbitrage part. So you have knowledge serendipity and knowledge arbitrage uh, where that could be applied and also with a public interest technology perspective in mind is uh, leveraging digital technologies, uh, building solutions, following the helical architectures and targeting uh, and assisting uh, displaced people. Of course, I have been talking about the environment, but this is in some regards an important uh, part of it too. And it's a priority displaced both internally and externally. This is not to refer to only to people coming from another country, uh, but uh, perhaps there could be ways to engage both types of displaced um, individuals to uh, provide opportunities for them. Uh, and then uh, there are other concepts I, I have referred to last time. Let me move on to the, um, uh, the end of this and then move, move to the second use case. Um, I'm mindful of the time. Um, this is how this could actually, uh, one way to develop solutions and even commercialize them in this in this manner. And this is a classical approach, a classic approach uh, in terms of piloting, prototyping, uh, testing, and then uh, you know validating and uh, and commercializing. The important descriptor of our research related to the role, important significance of the degree of maturity of an ecosystem as to whether and how it is sustainable, whether and how it is effective and efficient enough in its use of resources to provide and produce benefits and results is shown here. And this is a sort of a type of hockey stick, stick curve that actually shows uh, you know, the, the inflection point in effect represents the point where critical mass of maturity is attained. Up to that point, people, the key stakeholders and other potential participants are not convinced that if they engage, they will benefit more than they will uh, have to invest in. Uh, that certainly applies to entrepreneurs and innovators. Beyond that, you pass that point, somehow you word of mouth and other ways and means, uh, social media and so forth become a source of establishing that there is opportunity that is uh, valid, reliable and uh, worth taking advantage of. And then you have, of course, an exponential growth effect. Um, yeah, these are just some ways that we using the uh, intelligent agents uh, study, um, we identified, as I said, uh, ways and means that knowledge is used uh, and the happy accidents phenomenon, the discovery serendipitously of knowledge that is critical in its use. Um, and that is just one component in providing, designing and implementing, uh, providing options and then designing and implementing solutions based on the options you selected to act on. Now, a lot of, we've been talking a lot about knowledge. Well, the, the source of knowledge, the major source of knowledge, the, the generator, the engine of knowledge are the universities, uh, both in terms of uh, knowledge that is disseminated and shared through teaching. And then also, of course, new knowledge that is created through research. Um, we are proposing and discussing here something that I have been, as I mentioned in the previous discussion, uh, Michael Crowe's uh, president of the ASU's uh, ideas that I came across 15 some years ago were uh, certainly a strong influence. And then beyond that, I've developed some ideas that relate to what I call the fractal research education innovation ecosystem. In a way, it's reinventing and truly going away from the university in its traditional form. This is, uh, this is as a matter of fact, in reality, a medieval construct 
starting with the uh, religious institutions, monasteries that were teaching uh, dogma, and uh, still retains many aspects of all that. And the question is, can we envision a way and uh, an approach like with the helical architectures where instead of having a top-down structure, we actually have more of a balanced uh, top-down and bottom-up. Uh, in fact, more bottom-up driven structure um, that is much more dynamic, um, whether it is about themes and areas of focus in terms of teaching and or research, but also in terms of then the transfer of the results and the commercialization of those uh, is much more dynamic. It's uh, connecting the different stakeholders much more openly and proactively. And this is why I'm talking about a fractal, self-similar research, education, and innovation ecosystem. So you have the different key areas of the university and uh, also empowering the third mission results, uh, the outreach, getting out into the society and the economy the universities in the quintuple helix construct, uh, let me jump in, I apologize, bear with me, uh, are represented at the heart of this, um, um, in fact, if I find this, are represented at the heart of the uh, quintuple helix representation. The intent is to emphasize the, uh, the, the significance of having this kind of uh, uh, role for the university. So universities are surrounded by governments, I can't find that now, I apologize, but that's, uh, it, sh it was in the, should be in the slides. Uh, universities and government uh, uh, or industry rather, and then government and then civil society and then the environment, right? So um, then in closing, as far as universities go, can we uh, use the universities also as uh, facilitators, enablers of this balanced techno and human centric approach? that applies and connects to both industry and society 5.0. And uh, the issue here is education is critical to inform and uh, inspire and incentivize people to operate as, again, uh, active citizens, stakeholders that are part of the solution, not the problem. Okay, um, that's it. I, I have some closing slides here I've shown before. Um, I had some more I could have shared about the, uh, for instance, uh, an interesting case of a public interest technology that is really more about the um, the, the dark side of this. Uh, I'm referring and, and thinking of a movie of some 25 years ago called Minority Report, where technology actually uh, sort of was aware of who would, was, would be most likely to commit a crime and people were arrested in advance of committing a crime. Prevention and preemption was more important than uh, actual uh, human rights and assumption of innocence and all that. The, we may well be on that well on, we may well be well on that way uh, on, on this path uh, in some countries at least where there's social scoring for instance. Okay, so questions, yeah, and I guess I don't know. I see George Russos. Welcome um, uh, from the audience. Uh, I'm I'm uh, finished, done with the slides. As I mentioned, I need to um, conclude around 2 p.m. Uh, I'll be happy to give some extra time. That means we got about 15, 20 minutes. So please, hopefully there is uh, questions and discussion. We will not have uh, 20 minutes of awkward silence. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Elias Karianis. I think I might take over here and pass on to my co-host, Professor Katina Michael, for some reflections, and then we'll come back to some questions for our audience. Please feel free to indicate if you wish to speak or place your questions in the chat while Katina is reflecting. Katina, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Roba. Uh, what a talk, uh, Elias. We are presented with a view of public interest technology at scale. And I know scale has become a bit of a dirty word in some pockets in the world, uh, almost like this, this notion of taking over things. But uh, when we have these big ideas of how to make large scale change, uh, we need to think at that level. But of course, as you reminded us in your first talk, 
all change is local. And I've heard President Crow say that so many times. And you also spoke to us about the global. But this top down, bottom up approach actually is what Eleanor Ostrom used to talk about quite often, the Nobel Prize winner from the 2000s period uh, and her wonderful Ostrom and Ostrom work called The Workshop uh, at Indiana University and then at ASU for a short time, a bit of influence there in the School of Sustainability, which is part of the college uh, that puts on this particular pit event uh, weekly. So this top down bottom up is, is about being humble, but also knowing that these international organizations, these governance units that we're proposing to collaborate towards significant change to, in a co-design capacity actually rely on the people to make that change. And this is where the top down bottom up happens. So people do things, they've been doing it for centuries in places, white collar comes in and says, we need this change, let's institute it because we know better. But in fact, neither knows better, they just know different. And this cross pollinization that you've really talked to us about is what it's about. The locals know the local conditions, know the history, know the culture, know what kinds of processes, not so much shiny gadgetry, but the processes and procedures that have been done. And they can inform these uh, uh, new kinds of processes that are being imposed, perhaps by governance units or government agencies or regulators where we come together and basically, as we stated, uh, come to some kind of empowerment of one another. This takes coordination, as you mentioned, this takes collaboration, this takes this notion of an as is to be. I'm here today, but change is constant. If we look at the theory of change, how do we capture change? What is as is? Is it yesterday? Is it five years ago? Is it 20 years ago? And what's to be tomorrow, 10 years from now, 100 years from now, and what is the context? With that, I open up to you, uh, the audience. We're so grateful that you're here. Some incredible brains in the audience today. I recognize all of you. And I just want to be quiet now and pass back to Roba and say again, thank you to Elias for that part two. Part one will be available online. But Roba, back to you. As I know, we have lots of questions and limited time. Thank you so much, Katina. I might open to the floor before I ask any of, of my questions. Are there any immediate thoughts? questions or reflections from our attendees. Again, thank you for attending. We're delighted to have you here with us. Okay, so we've got one in the chat from Jumana Aburazeli. Welcome, Jumana. Lovely to have you here with us. Um, thank you so much for a great talk. How do we count for differences in power across the helices? Great question. Over to you, Professor Karianis. Yeah, well, um, what do we mean uh, differences in power? You mean institutional, executive, uh, resource power, um, all of these? And why is that, why um, this is important as a question? So I, I do that sometimes. I, I turn the question back to the uh, source of it especially my students appreciate that, I'm sure. But can you tell me uh, again uh, why uh, exactly what you mean and why is that an important question before I address it? Um, yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Sorry, Jumana, we can hear you. Can I get you to just briefly introduce yourself or Professor Karianis before you go ahead and uh, clarify that? Oh, question? sure, of course. Um, thank you so much, Professor. Uh, my name is Jumana Abouazali, and I am um, I'm the uh, founder of a nonprofit called Pivot for Humanity that is um, focused on um, professionalizing um, social technology. Um, more on that later if you're interested, but that's uh, the synopsis of who I am. Um, my question is with uh, regards to how um, how the balance of power is distributed across the helices. And it's important because, for example, um, who speaks or acts on behalf of the environment? And how how does that, how does, it, you know, there, there's a difference between actors and being acted upon. And uh, it seems that the environment, for example, is a resource we continually use, but um, don't doesn't necessarily speak for itself and, uh, until cataclysms or disasters. Um, so uh, how do we, I guess the, the question is, is this a model 
um, is, is a model, a reflection of how things are or a tool to shape how things should be. And if they should be, how do we establish um, uh, a center of gravity that is e equitable, I guess, across all helices? Yeah, I, uh, I just uh, try to respond at least partly to this. And this is a very valid question. Uh, I, there's always uh, room for, um, well, abuse, but as I said already, past passivity and inaction are probably worse uh, um, uh, options than trying to make a positive difference with the risk of, of, of triggering negative uh, side effects and externalities. So what I mean is the environment, in my mind, and this is not, I think others have uh, been proposing, uh, been proponents of this. Uh, the environment could and should be legally and institutionally recognized and represented. And um, therefore, it shouldn't be just uh, incumbent upon uh, the goodwill and the courage and the uh, sacrifice even of in, in specific NGOs to defend aspects of the uh, environment's uh, existence and, and in that sense by extension rights um, or try to mitigate the negative impact on all of us as they're being abused and violated. Um, the same goes for animals, of course. And the issue here is how can we uh, identify um, both the, the benefits and the costs? This is really cost-benefit analysis. It shouldn't be just about only about our humanity and emotions and feeling better about environmental uh, safeguarding or even animal rights protection. It, it should really be a realization that there are real, in some ways, or in many ways, tangible and quantifiable costs and benefits, depending on how we choose to act. And the costs of, again, wrong behavior and action should be uh, increased and enhanced and made better understood uh, through uh, means appropriate within the democratic uh, process and, and, and discourse on all levels, including legal, as I mentioned. Um, as far as, um, yeah, uh, so the, 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 I don't know if I addressed the question. There's some more uh, Jason comments here. Just a second, please, before I get to that. Um, so uh, this is the, the use, in my mind, the, the, the validity and, uh, and utility of the helices and the helical approach is that it may help identify areas where uh, interests uh, may both converge but also conflict across the different key stakeholders and start the thinking and the process of discovery and uh, exploration of best ways forward, best ways to establish win-win-win configurations uh, and getting beyond, and that's, I referred to partisan mutual adjustment before. Um, and this should be uh, embedded, institutionalized, enacted and adopted as broadly and as profoundly as possible because there's always uh, opportunities for uh, uh, disruption, opportunities where fear, greed, and other instincts take over. And uh, of course, when you have actual war, I mean, coming to Jason's comments, uh, you know, uh, diplomas in war are two sides of the same coin. I think it's Clausewitz said that uh, war is diplomacy by other means. Uh, maybe witnessing that as we speak. Now, the point is, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree that a valueless technology, any type of valueless education is simply dangerous. In fact, it's not just useless or counterproductive, it is dangerous because you empower people to, uh, you know, you give them tools and ways and means to have bigger impact without necessarily having the concerns, considerations, and constraints of, of values. At the end of my presentation, I had a slide, uh, two quotes from Plato about the need for uh, kings to be philosophers 
So leaders need to have themselves, first of all, um, a profound uh, uh, grounding in values, mm -hmm. including democracy and its implications. And the other is how everything is interconnected, the systems approach and perspective that goes and connects with what I just said. So when you pollute the environment, you're violating basic human rights, especially of those with lesser means to mitigate the impact. And yes, so that, that is huge issue. So civic education should not be just, I mean, it used to be much more widely and significantly recognized. And the other sad thing is that, you know, of course, clearly there are many sources and ways and means to, um, uh, to recognize and benefit from uh, ideas and values and knowledge. But uh, as I mentioned before, there can be uh, actually less, um, less successful, let's say less productive and constructive uh, ways to drive your points and, your, and, 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 and claim your rights. And I'm talking about uh, a sort of political correctness um, that has led to talking about, um, you know, old white men and uh, referring to, or ancient, uh, referring to the, the ancient, the, 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 you know, the ancestors of ours that actually uh, have actually been uh, uh, the source of insights, including Plato. So in some universities in the US, they have been uh, en masse rejected uh, so that, so as to make a point that there needs to be, as there is a need for more inclusiveness. Uh, so uh, this is not just about the elders, and that's important too that you mentioned. Uh, but also, I, you know, I was reflecting uh, on the interviews and the comments that um, Elon Musk uh, shared um, recently, and he was. Uh, saying that, uh, you know, the, the billionaires are much more effective and efficient in that sense, uh, stewards of capital. That may be true up to a point. Uh, we know well, and if any one of their stories and evolutionary paths are studied truly and transparently, uh, we will discover a lot of both serendipity, but also arbitrage opportunities. So, they had, of course, the talent and insight to identify opportunities. But even Musk himself, he would have gone bankrupt uh, perhaps more than once a few years back if the US government had not bailed him out. So um, the point is that, uh, you know, we need imagination. Uh, we also need courage and humility in this process. And uh, so, the elders, the billionaires could be a community that needs to recognize exactly because of their control of so much capital that they have a, a public interest responsibility and uh, 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 obligation uh, to act as stewards of the public interest um, and become uh, an NGO, become an NGO that actually, uh, <laughs> in a sense, uh, that actually provides input, but in a transparent way and in a way that is not maximizing or pursuing their, their own self-interest. So that is a very important thing. Otherwise, yes, the role of elders is critical. Um, but again, as you mentioned, should be beyond politics. Okay, I agree with that. It's very important. Uh, by the way, um, the, 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 the letters BP uh, years ago with uh, the tragedy in the uh, in the Gulf uh, with the BP uh, horizon uh, catastrophe and there's been many others unfortunately I, I used to talk about British pollution uh, standing for BP but that's also beyond politics another way to use the, the letter so any other questions here I think Professor Carianz, I might uh, call on Jason for any follow-ups or any comments that you'd like to make, Jason. Uh, I know you have a hard stop, is that correct, uh, Elias? Yeah, we have, uh, let's say, another 10 minutes, okay? so we Perfect. Can... Excellent. So, Jason, uh, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Rova. Can you hear me okay? I can, and I might ask you for a brief intro as well, Jason, for those sure. who don't know you. Um, Thank you. Professor, it's um, an honour to just sit here and listen. Um, 
a lot of what you've talked about i've written copious notes three pages i think i've just asked my department chair professor Mille terzioski to join us um, you've already spoken and i said quick jump in quick um, otherwise i'll get the recording for him because this is um thank you jason Millet's here so that's good um so um a lot of the things um Elias, that you're talking about. So diplomacy is important, I think, but I, I've never been taught diplomacy. I'm sorry, professor of what and where, and you also, if you would you please? Yeah, sorry. So we're at Swinburne uh, University of Technology in Melbourne. And we've got a new vision and mission to put people and technology together for a better world. And I've sort of been doing that for the last 20 years or so. I have did my PhD on the thai Burma border, um, looking at refugee education, and I teach professional issues in IT, everything from ethics, privacy, wicked problems, COP, social capital, Jedi type stuff, to undergrads and some masters. And I take a small group of students over to remote India. So when I get into those environments, nobody taught me how to be diplomatic and to, um, you know, to be able to step through those often minefields that you have with those clients or people you work with, some of them I would consider family, they're that close to me. Um, the digitally illiterate, I think is another important part of the mix that we need to think about working in public interest technology. Um, but you were talking about the UN and that got me thinking that maybe it's not the billionaires, it's maybe these elders, more states persons, people um, like the Mandela's were, who are maybe one step away who can be almost like a conscience and influencer to the billionaires to remind them um, the way to go, like translators. Um, and then with the UN, I was trying to think, what is the antithesis of the mutually assured destruction? Whatever that is, that's what I think we as public interest technologists are trying to do. And we can get that through, I think, um, your bullet point E that you were talking about with the UN and um, the European Union. So lots and lots of um, follow-ups. So I'll probably be in touch, but um, just thank you for touching on all those points and um, any feedback or follow-ups from those. Yeah. Um, sure. L let me mention two things. Of course, I, I will welcome. In fact, uh, feel free to share uh, your notes and, uh, and, 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 and annotate them if you want with questions sure. or comments. I'll try to respond. But First of all, we need to, as I said, reinvent the UN. Uh, the reality is that, and, and there is a lot of criticism and during the years that I, I spent uh, working uh, near uh, at the University of George Washington, but also with the World Bank and so forth. The reality is that these are institutions and organizations that were formed um, by Western democracies, at the end of the Second World War, and uh, there was significant positive, let's say, and even altruistic intent, but the reality is that there are other aspects of those, okay? And they're perceived as means of uh, perpetuating and promoting a certain perspective. And of course, we know about the Washington Consensus imposing liberal uh, approaches and structures on countries, often with short-term, at least, negative effects, even though the long-term intent was much more uh, again i would say i want to believe well well intentioned uh, 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 in any case there are uh, a lot has been learned or should have been a lot of more wisdom is available and should be used in terms of how we design our interventions in my uh, slides and comments last time and today i briefly touched on these things there's a lot more in terms of designing leapfrogging strategies and trade-offs moving from natural scarcity to artificial abundance leveraging technology ensuring that we don't end up with more scarcity than abundance and yeah so the issue of equity there's, there's tremendous uh, gaps tremendous divides uh you talked about india i mentioned syria and if someone really uh, understands what's going on there. Uh, it's amazing that a lot more in terms of uh, reactions, uh, negative reactions, I mean, including violent reactions, have not been taking place. And I think we need to uh, both reinvent, perhaps uh, recreate 
uh, a proper uh, global structure. And that's where all kinds of groups uh, with uh, social, human, intellectual, uh, and financial capital uh, resources need to come into play in place. So the billionaires, but also others, the NGOs, uh, somehow we need to figure out ways. And there, there needs to be, in my uh, opinion, and, and I hope there will be leaders from its group that will figure out a way to establish uh, a global connection um, to actually uh, identify and formulate uh, priorities. Um, you know, things like the World Economic Forum and so forth have really been uh, initiatives that aimed to promote specific views and operate in a specific way, not necessarily uh, for the planet or for the public, uh, in my mind. And inevitably, they've become uh, marginalized. So this is a big, you know, the challenging times we live in are also times of great opportunity, in my opinion. And I want to believe I, I, I don't want to become uh, uh, sort of a, a pessimist. Um, so any other comments? Thank you, Jason, for your input. And, and uh, I welcome, of course, your professor too. Any other comments? Do we have any other comments from the floor? I might end Professor Karianis with one of my own tying to the theme of this series, our fourth series of the Pitt Colloquium, um, and really touching on a lot of the, uh, I guess, concepts that you spoke about. So you, you mentioned as part of your talk, did this talk and the previous, the key to all of this is stakeholders. So collaboration across sectors, and so much more tied to that notion. Um, we feel that transdisciplinarity and establishment of the appropriate transdisciplinary frameworks is key here, uh, in addition to the integration of co-design as part of that um, transdisciplinary approach. And we know as part of your work and as part of our readings that you've used a lot of these co-words. So you've used coexistence, you mentioned co-evolution, co-specialization, co-petition, and so on. Um, do you have any ready thoughts as to the value of adding co-design to those co-words? Um, and also, what do you see as some of the potential challenges in, um, in encouraging a transdisciplinary approach? There are many documented, I guess, criticisms of transdisciplinarity. Um, any thoughts on either the co-design approach or transdisciplinarity, just yes. to wrap up this session? Sure, of course, and thank you. And uh, it's thank a very you, good Professor. question to come to close for today. I, I definitely welcome input uh, going forward. I shared my email and uh, be happy to also engage uh, uh, online um, uh, if there is an opportunity. Um, look, I think transdisciplinarity, co-design is inherently intrinsic in all of these other co-words, you know, starting with co, uh, co-evolution, co-specialization, Competition. They all imply and, in effect, define co-design. If you think about it, right? So co-design does not need to be added. It's already there. If you truly, if one really starts truly understanding what we're talking about, because this is how nature, in fact, uh, redesigns and reinvents, reinvents, and, and you know, the, the 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 evolution of the species itself. If you think about it, it's co-design, competition co-evolution, co-specialization, and then, of course, in the process, the emergence of more uh, viable solutions uh, from a natural perspective. Um, and uh, the other the other word, transdisciplinarity, that also, in my mind, this is about thinking, as I say, beyond the box, not just trying to be incrementally creative, but truly uh, radically transformative. This is a difference between thinking outside the box and beyond the box. Establishing uh, freedom in your envisioning and your thinking without, of course, forgetting knowledge and, and experience, but allowing your intuition and your imagination to express themselves. And that's really essentially transdisciplinarity. So in my mind, even those who criticize it actually are practicing it in a way without realizing it. Now, I don't mean to, 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 to sound like some sort of a cult voice here talking about this, but the point is, uh, how do we get beyond our uh, biases, our uh, grounded 
perspectives that are embedded in our even DNA and, and, and how do we learn to, as I said, become overall or evolve as a species and as you use the word co-design our solutions going forward. So this, this is, if you go back and I'll close with that, a reference to the text I have posted on the Journal of the Knowledge Economy webpage, the New Earth Initiative. I really think that is a call that could be hopefully used as a frame of reference and a parting point of departure for, for co-design actions and initiatives. And, and in a transdisciplinary, transformative way. I hope this comes to be, and I certainly uh, am in, encouraged by the presence of your, your uh, hospitality and recognition, uh, you and Professor Michael, and of course, all the others here. Thank you so much, Professor, and what a lovely way to end this session. We do recognise that we're out of time with you, Professor Elias Karianis. A big thank you for joining us today and also for your many contributions, both your academic contributions and those specifically to the fourth series of our Public Interest Technology Colloquium. It's certainly going to be very valuable to debrief post this talk and to move forward with some of these ideas that you've uh, suggested, that you've identified in order to consider both those challenges and opportunities, you also mentioned the word balance, which is so very important, and you so eloquently identified and explored so many aspects and ideas that we really need to think deeply about during both of your talks. Uh, for our live attendees, thank you so much for joining us for this session, and we welcome, as Professor Kariana said, further discussion and dialogue. Uh, Professor Kariana has placed his email in the chat, and Katina and I would be interested um, to further this discussion with you. So if you are interested in finding out more, contributing to or joining us as we work toward this vision or shared vision for transdisciplinarity in the public interest, please get in touch. And finally, if you would like to revisit this talk or the first um, delivered by Professor Karianis, the recordings will be made available on Arizona State University School for the Future of Innovation in Society YouTube channel. And we'll also be placing these on IEEE TV. Uh, you'll also be able to access on these channels other sessions from series one through to four of the colloquium. And as always, and on behalf of myself and my co-host, Professor Katina Michael, we'd like to thank you for your attendance and we look forward to seeing you in the next session of series four of the Pitt Colloquium. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Bye Thank now. You.